Hi, this is Doug from Dynamic Computing, and welcome to episode 45 of 10-Minute Amiga Retrocast, Amiga 1000 Adventures. Now, if you've been watching my channel, you know that the Adventure series is where I cover a specific Amiga model, talk about its history, do a little review on it, and see what, what she can do. This week, we're concentrating on my new Amiga 1000. Now, I had an Amiga 1000 in the past, maybe 2010, 2011 or so. I picked one up off of eBay for a good price. It was beautiful. It had a Zorro slot expansion on the side, this big box that had like two Zorro cards in it. Worked beautifully, happy as a clam with it. But at the time, I was not really doing anything at all with my Amigas. And I swear, if I turned that thing on three times in the years that I had it, it'd be amazing. I just didn't do anything with them. Um, so come around to 2015, needed the money, okay? So I went through my storage, I found a bunch of my old Amigas, sold them on eBay, including my Amiga 1000 with its sidecar expansion, its slot expansion. Oh my goodness, made good money off of it, but oh boy, now after 2018 when I got back full force into the Amiga community, boy did I regret it. So, since I got back in the community, I've been keeping my eye out for an Amiga 1000 at a good price. Enter Amy West 2019, back in October. I'm listening to one of the conferences. Brian, the host of the show, is up there chatting after, at the end of one of the conferences, one of the speakers, and says, you know, this, that, and the other thing, and we'll have an Amiga 1000 for sale at my booth at the end of this uh, part of the show. And my eyes phew, lit up. And I wandered over to the table and he looked at me and said, you want that Amiga 1000, don't you? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it was in the price I was looking for, for one. I wasn't planning on buying a new computer at Amy West, but c'est la vie. So I took the plunge and I bought it and I bought a nice A2010, sorry, an A1010 floppy drive and a perfect sound digitizer designed for the Amiga 1000. Now here I am sharing my beautiful new Amiga with none other than Trevor Dickinson from Aeon, who makes the brand new Amigas. So, you know, a little bit uh, before uh, the time of the PowerPC Amigas, but he really enjoyed it, and the history of the unit is undeniable. So this got me thinking. As most of us know, the inside of the Amiga case was originally signed by the Amiga luminaries of its day. Uh, David Morse, J. Minor, um, Ron Nicholson, and quite a few other people have their signatures on the inside of the case. What if I took the box, which was in pretty good condition, and had current Amiga luminaries sign that? So here's the box, and she's, as you can see, in perfectly good shape, and I've already got signatures on there from Trevor Dickinson, and from Mike Bodliana. Now, unfortunately, I missed getting it signed by Ron Nicholson, who was there Friday, but I did not pick up my Amiga 1000 until Saturday, so I missed getting him to sign the box. That would have been just delightful. My plan is to bring the box to different Amiga events over the next couple of years and have it signed by Amiga luminaries today. Not just developers, but people who are in the community. So don't be surprised if you see me walking up with an Amiga 1000 box and a Sharpie marker and want you to put your signature on there. On to the beautiful Amiga 1000 itself. Of course, this machine is the brainchild of many people from the original Amiga Inc many of them shown here in this picture. Chief among them was David Morse and Jay Minor, who many of us are familiar with, but many, many others were involved with the original development of the technology. One of the goals was to make a machine that was different and better than what was already out there. By now, we had seen the tired PCs with their green screens and their plinks and their boops, and the team wanted to move past that Eventually, they were bought up by Commodore. There are a great many stories on YouTube that cover the history of the Amiga, and I will link to them in the description. But what I want to do is concentrate on the machine itself. It was released with unbelievable fanfare. 
with the team showing up along with people like Deborah Harry and Andy Warhol, who famously created some fantastic Amiga artwork live on stage. This was really the public's first glimpse of the Amiga as a creative computer. Who cares about spreadsheets and databases? Leave that to the clunky PCs. This computer was creative and targeted to the artist as well as the home user. The Amiga launched at $1,295 without a monitor and $1,595 with one. It has a Motorola 68,000 CPU running at about 7 MHz, 256 kilobytes of RAM, which most people quickly upgraded to 512 kilobytes, an internal 880K floppy, and the custom chips that really make her sing and dance. We will look closer at those chips in a few minutes. Specs are fine, but what really set the Amiga apart is what she could do. 4,096 color palette, stereo sound, and honest-to-goodness multitasking were things that the other computers literally could not do at all. The Macintosh of that age had the same CPU, and it had what, like two colors, maybe four on a good day? The audio on virtually all the other computers paled by comparison, and none of them could multitask. I remember people telling me back in the 80s how useless multitasking was, as you could only do one thing at a time. But I will tell you, the first time I had a song playing, a graphics program running, and a BBS online, and I switched between them in the blink of an eye, I was hooked, and I could not go back to the old way of doing things. Things began appearing to enhance the Amiga's creative potential. Video digitizers, audio digitizers, and painting programs began appearing, and people used the Amiga as a creative tool. The geniuses at Amiga had the timing and signaling of the Amiga compatible with NTSC video standards, so combining your home or business videos with 4096 color graphics was now within reach of everyone. This brings me to the next topic, the pure beauty of this machine, inside and outside. Like the Macintosh, this is just a lovely machine. It's really nice to look at. The design was attractive from the clean lines to the wonderful keyboard garage. That's this little beauty right here, where she literally slides right under the machine when you're not using it. That was what Jay Miner's idea. He absolutely loved that. And it is just ingenious. It's uncluttered, yet expandable with standard serial ports and parallel ports. Okay, they were gender changed, but they were still somewhat compatible. And for real power, you could add things on the side over here on this slot, such as memory, hard drive controllers, accelerators, and even actual PCs. They had a unit you could stick on the side uh, called the sidecar that had an 8088 computer, maybe it was an 8086 computer, built right into it that ran DOS. Pretty clever. Now, here's what I'm talking about with aesthetics. See the 1010 drive matches up perfectly with the computer. Back here, you've got my perfect sound digitizer, plugs right into the parallel port, and then just pops right up off the back and sets itself up right there. And a few minutes ago, you saw in one of my pictures my G1300 Genlock and how that slides right underneath the back of the case. Really nicely aesthetically designed. It's a brilliant design and a very special time for the fledgling Amiga community. Now, I love all of my Amigas. The Amiga 500 was the first machine I got and it was beautiful. Uh, here's a picture of that. The Amiga 2000 incredibly powerful, ex incredibly expandable, but it's a beast and it looks like a just a regular computer. Things changed with the Amiga 3000. It got much more attractive and went back to the idea of making a computer that was genuinely attractive. The Amiga 4000 kind of went back the way of the looking like a PC, but it's still an attractive machine. Charm and personality can only get you so far. Let's take a look under the hood of this Amiga. Let's take a look 
at the insides of this little beautiful Amiga 1000. Now, I honestly believe I'm the first person since this was purchased in 1985 who's had this lid off. All of the screws were perfectly in place, not a sign of a single one of them being manipulated. And there are little um, metal tabs here that lock the, the RF shield in place. Those hadn't been touched. They were still perfectly tweaked and, and connected in there. So I don't think this has ever, ever been open. So she was cherry. Now over here, we have our lovely Denise chip, which gives us our graphics modes. Now this is the revision six chip, which means this version has extra half bright. If you've got a revision four chip in your Amiga 1000, you're missing the extra half bright mode. And I think maybe something to do with the uh, one of the audio filters too. Uh, over here, we have our regular sized Agnes, just the standard Agnes before she put on all that weight. Um, 512k chip ram is a big limitation and it's probably the biggest limitation i'm going to be dealing with with this machine but i'm going to see if i can overcome that uh, i soon i should have uh, seven or eight megabytes of fast ram in here and uh, i'll just be careful with what i use this for and hopefully 512 will be enough uh, over here we have our paula chip the one chip that's barely changed at all in the entire generation of the amiga that's always stayed just about the same here we have our daughter board. Now this is where the writable control store exists, where when you boot it up, the Kickstart ROM uh, puts itself into some memory on here. PAL machines do not have this. They redid the board, they integrated all this onto the main board. So this daughter board's NTSC only, and I think maybe even some later versions of the NTSC machine didn't have this, but, but maybe all of them did. Moving right along, we have this gigantic floppy drive, which is the size of one of the old style hard drives. This thing's a monster. And this is actually what prevents a lot of expansions from working internally, because a lot of internal expansions would love to work on this nice 68,000 chip right here. But it's just so close to the floppy, they physically don't fit in. Um, but luckily, most expansions made for the Amiga 500 that use this slot on the side over here will work okay. You just have to invert them because this is upside down. Or maybe the Amiga 500 is upside down since this is the original. Um, beautiful board. Beautiful, clean, absolutely not even a speck of dust inside this. So I'm so happy with whoever took care of it before I uh, got a hold of it. Now back here... We see some of the connectors. Of course, we've got our power supply and we have a TV modulator connector here. Uh, RF, that's where RF video would go. Uh, this is a composite cable. And I'll tell you what, this has some of the cleanest and nicest looking composite video I've ever seen in a computer. It really looks good. Left and right audio here. Uh, your standard serial connector here standard Amiga floppy drive connector, and a printer connector, which is actually reversed from every other printer connector on the planet. This one's a male. Most parallel ports are female. While you can theoretically just get a gender changer and flip it around, one of these pins has some voltage on it that normal parallel doesn't carry, so it can be rather precarious. But it's not a big deal. I'm not going to be printing on this anyways. And I've got my nice... Uh, a perfect sound digitizer, audio digitizer that plugs right into there. Doesn't offer a pass through, but that's fine. And then we have our very funky keyboard connector, which is like an RJ11 type phone connector. Uh, uncommon to find a replacement if you lose yours, but one can be made. It's just a, you have to know the right pinouts for it. Let's flip it around to the front. Okay, now I've taken the front cover off. This is where the 512K comes from. It has 256K on board, and this is a 256K chip RAM expander. Now, I really wish, and I haven't found anything, that there would be some way to utilize this expansion for something else besides 512K. If, if they had come up with a cool way to put uh, more memory on here or, or, or something, that'd be great, but I have not seen it. Then we've got our standard floppy drive here, Terribly reliable, but very big and bulky. And our lovely 
Amiga checkmark logo that matches the shirt that I'm wearing. I really like that logo. So that's a little bit about the Amiga 1000. Let's get her put back together and see what she can do. Now that we have it put back together, let's explore the OS a little bit. Now the Amiga 1000, as I mentioned when we were looking at the insides of the video, of the computer, needs a kickstart floppy to boot. That little daughter board in there has uh, 256K of RAM on it that it boots kickstart from floppy. So in a second, we'll see the image come up here on the screen. Gives us lovely little musical notes. We put our kickstart in. Now it'll handle anywhere from 1.0 up to kickstart 1.3. Kickstart 2.0 and above were too big, being 512K ROM. So they won't work on this unless you have some other device that allows you to use that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Once Kickstart is loaded into ROM, it asks for your workbench disk. This happens to be Workbench 1.3. While this did make updating the operating system really easy because all you needed were floppies. You never even needed to open it up. It did make it a little more difficult to get things like auto booting from hard drives working properly. All right, we're all booted up and you can see here it says about 370 kilobytes free out of 512. Now I found in my two weeks of experimenting with this, that programs like uh, Deluxe Paint 3 work okay. Let's get that loaded. But you're limited to some of the lower resolutions. Like I could do 32 color, 320 by 200 images without any problem. But once I started to get into like 640 by 416 colors, boom, I would run out of memory in a heartbeat. Uh, things like Photon Paint worked great. That's a 4096 color ham program. I was able to run that just fine with 512 kilobytes. That wasn't any problem. I could even digitize sounds on my perfect sound digitizer if I wanted to limit myself to like four seconds of good quality sound, maybe eight seconds of mediocre quality sound. Not quite enough to do a lot with, but make a couple of cool sound effects. Games were tough. Anything before 1988, 1987 worked okay as they were designed for 512K Amigas. But anything after that, it was hit or miss. Some games work fine with only 512K of RAM, literally only 512K of RAM. Some of them would have worked perfect if I would have just had a little more fast RAM in the system. Um, I had an issue with word processing, which I figured would be a breeze. For years, I used Professional Write or ProWrite on my Amiga 500 back in the day with one megabyte. Um, and over the years, I had updated it, kept it up to the latest version. So that's the one I have on my disk is the latest version, 3.12 or 3.2. Kept running out of memory. Every time I'd launch it, sometimes the screen would come up and then no menus would work. Just run out of memory. So if I wanted to do word processing, I would need to find a word processor made before 1987 to work properly on this machine. My final opinion is I don't really want to work on a 512 kilobyte machine. It was fun experimenting and I don't regret it a bit. And playing with Workbench 1.3 again brought back a lot of good memories, but I'm so used to all the powerful features that came with 2.0 up to 3.1.4, it's hard to go back. Now here's the good news. The Amiga 1000 can be made into an incredibly powerful machine today. Okay, you can use something like the ACA 500 Plus that I reviewed several months ago from uh, uh, Jens at Individual Computers. That'll bring your Amiga 1000 up to a 42 megahertz 68,000 CPU, theoretical, seven megabytes of fast RAM, the ability to switch between different kink starts, just like I showed you in my video, works absolutely beautifully in the Amiga 1000, or something like this. This is the classic 520 from Irix Labs. Now, I'm gonna be doing a big review on this next week, but I'll introduce it to you a little bit right now. Uh, she has a CF card that you can use to boot from. This is not a hot swap CF card. This is something you use to boot with. It has an SD card here that is hot swappable. Now I just have a little tiny 256 meg one in there, but 
you know, for transferring data back and forth right now, that's all I need. It has an IDE port on it. So if you want to hook up an external uh, a hard drive, you want to hook up a CD-ROM drive, this works at the same time as the CF card and the SD card. They're not mutually exclusive. It's got eight megabytes of RAM on board, full eight megabytes, not like not seven megabytes like the ACA 500 plus. It has a 68020 CPU running at 28 megahertz, fast little guy. And it has the ability to handle uh, loading a kickstart ROM right into flash memory on here. Just one ROM. You can't have multiple ROMs like you can on the ACA 500 plus. So I've got Amiga OS 3.1.4 ROMs burned onto this little guy, but it's a breeze to swap them. And I'll go over that in the full video I do in a few weeks. Now, keep in mind that even though this is the same slot in an A1000 as you have in an A500, it's the opposite on the opposite side of the machine. So instead of the little cards facing towards you, they face away from you. Just make sure you install it uh, the proper direction or you can destroy things like I've done before. <laughs> now let's put things in perspective here. This is a computer from 1985 using technology that was actually available back in the late 80s and early, early 90s, okay? I'm able to play back full screen ham six animations i'm able to run mp3 files through here playback mp3 files and music files and 4096 color images take a look at what this little amiga 1000 can do hey that looks familiar i wonder where that's from playing back on an amiga 1000 guys Oh, look at that handsome devil. Boy, look at that guy. And uh, that's before I cluttered up my office with 8,000 other computers, too. How about that? But uh, not too shabby for an Amiga 1000, huh? This is something that I recorded right off of my Perfect Sound digitizer here. Now take a look at some of these ham six images that it can handle. There we go. This is one of them I've shown you before. This is at the Grand Canyon, uh, taken with my uh, digital camera and then brought in uh, as a JPEG file and converted to a, just a ham six 320 by 400 image. Not half bad. Now here's something from someone we all know, Eric Schwartz. Back in 1996, he made this picture. All our fates are now in the hands of the juggler. We can only pray she's not the type who might drop the ball. Can you believe it's now 2019? This is, uh, oh, what is that, 23 years later? It's still up in the air what's happening with the Amiga. I mean, we, we sort of know who, who owns it, but 23 years later, still an accurate image. Now we're running things right through my A1300 Genlock. You can see workbench in the background here, no problem at all. Tell me again why the Mac and the PC won the computer race, because I, I really don't remember. Yes, the old girl still has spirit, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm going to be having a lot of fun with this Genlock on future videos, too. Now, full disclosure, even with my accelerated Amiga now, she still only does have 512 kilobytes of chip RAM. And that is not normally 
increasable without pretty much swapping out the entire motherboard or, or doing something drastic to the inside. Uh, just check out the kind of stuff that Amiga Love does with his. Um, I'll put a link down here for his website, but he's done some really cool things with his Amiga 1000. It does affect me only having 512 kilobytes of RAM. For example, the other day, I could only have Deluxe Paint 3, Amiga Vision, and the ProSound Digitizer running simultaneously in multitasking before I ran out of memory completely, ran out of chip memory. Poor me. My final thoughts on the Amiga 1000. I can understand why this is such a highly sought after computer. I really do. It's beautiful. It is still functional even after all these years, especially after putting in a hard drive and some RAM expansion. This thing can do just about anything I need it to do. What would I give this machine? Even today, this thing gets five beautiful rainbow colored Amiga check marks out of five without hesitation. Thanks for joining me. Please stay tuned over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to do a full review on the Classic 520 Accelerator, and I'm also going to have a video all about the, the uh, A1300 Genlock, which is still displaying lovely images down here for us. <laughs> Be sure to follow me on Twitter, at 10Mark1. Be sure to like and subscribe. That really does help get the channel noticed. You know what? Let me let the Amiga 1000 take care of the rest. Until next week, this is Doug's Amiga 1000 from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, signing out. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs>